<clears throat> well, again, I want to welcome everyone to this uh, virtual meeting of the Gloucester County Nature Club. Uh, oftentimes when we have our meeting in February, uh, we don't have a formal program. We have what we call an interactive program in which we, uh, we members get together and share things uh, <clears throat> about nature and about experiences. And uh, this time we thought we would, we, would let, we would talk a little bit about some of the books we've been reading lately and share some of those with the memberships that are membership uh, people that have tuned in tonight. It's always good to find out what, about a good book. I've um, so many books that I've enjoyed I'd never heard of until someone told me about them. So that's what we're going to be doing tonight. And uh, five of us have actually prepared short talks on books we've read recently. And uh, also when we're finished with that, if anyone else would like to share anything about a, a book that they would have, you're most welcome to, uh, to join in and tell us about something that you've read. So I think we can get started. This is very informal. Uh, and again, I, uh, as far as I'm concerned, if you, anybody wants to break in with questions or anything, that's fine. We want to be conversational about this. It's not a formal presentation. It's a conversation and a sharing of knowledge. <clears throat> so um, is there anyone who would like to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Chris? Okay. All right. Well, this is a book for all of us that love a good murder mystery. It's the Slime Mold Murder. <laughs> and uh, the author... Ellen King Rice is a wildlife biologist who loves drama and biology and diversity, and she lives in the Northwest woods. And the story takes place in the Northwest along the coast. And the main character is Dylan, who is a college student who is struggling to find the funds to finish his last semester at college. And uh, he's befriended by a recent widower and his 12-year-old daughter who have a property along the coast. And they, uh, they employ him to do a biological survey on their property. And he's the perfect person for it because he, um, he has a degree. Well, his degree will be in botany. Uh, he knows a lot about botany and, and slime molds. So... Um, the plot thickens and uh, a body is discovered in the pet cemetery. And I can tell you right now, the person that was killed was not killed by the slime mold. <laughs> <laughs> and the author, Ellen King Rice, she it begins every chapter with a little excerpt about slime molds or a picture of a slime mold. And um, <clears throat> for those of you who aren't familiar with slime molds, Slime molds are not an animal. They are alive, but they're not an animal. They're not a plant. Even though the, their name is mold, they're not even a fungus. They're not like the mold that grows on your bread or the mold that grows down in your basement. They're, they're not that kind of a mold. They're an organism, but they're only one cell and um, <clears throat> they have a cell wall, but they can be as big as a bath mat and they have, instead of just having one nuclei, like we're used to cells having, they can have thousands and thousands of nuclei. So they are a really strange kind of organism. Um, <clears throat> and she does really get your curiosity going about them in this book. And, and you learn some about them. You want to learn more about them. I don't know. <clears throat> I never knew very much about them until this past year when we did the the eco challenge. Um, and so I have seen a few, um, you know, they, they do, um, we've looked at them with hand lenses and taken pictures of them with close up cameras. Um, but they do, um, they have Latin names, but they also have some pretty cool common names. Like we've seen, um, ones that are called, um, chocolate tubes and wolf's milk. Um, there's candy cane slime mold. So whoever named them has had a good time <laughs> with the names of them. Um, and they can, they eat, they eat algae and bacteria and they can move, they can reproduce and they can react with their environment. So just like they make uh, mazes for, for mice, scientists and laboratories have studied these slime molds and they actually um, can go through a maze to follow food at the end of it. 
Um, so, so even though they're they're thought to be one of the first organisms um, to be on the planet Earth, um, they now they're a, you know become a study subject for intelligence in in <clears throat> an organism like them, and so you know they're finding out more about them all the time. Um, yeah, so it's a really good book. It combines, you know, fiction, the murder mystery, and um, and a knowledge about uh, slime molds. <laughs> Could you hold it up again, Chris? Sure. <coughs> Very dark, <coughs> curious cover. <laughs> Very cool. cool. Mm -hmm. The Slime Mold Murder by Ellen King Rice. Any questions from the audience about the book or about slime molds? Did the butler do it? <laughs> I can't give no spoilers now. Okay. Okay. I tell you it wasn't the slime mold. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Chris. That was great. Uh, who would like to go next? Any takers? I'll go. All right, Karen. Okay, um, the book that I chose, it's a favorite of mine, it's called um, 100 Flowers and How They Got Their Names. Um, it's uh, written by an author named Diana Wells. She's a, a garden writer and a historian. She um, was born in Jerusalem, lived in England and Italy, but actually now um, and for a while has uh, lived on a farm right um, outside of Philadelphia. Um, it's, um, the illustrations are by the award-winning artist, um, Ippy, uh, Patterson. So th this isn't a change the world kind of book or, or, uh, a spellbinding mystery. It's just this wonderfully written, beautifully illustrated volume about how these particular 100 plants got their names. Um, now I'm a gardener and fortunate enough to have a, a, a great space to garden. Um, I have plants for the birds and the butterflies and the other pollinators. Um, I have um, plants that my mother loved. I have plants that just e either and either or smell wonderful um, or just absolutely beautiful. Um, so this is what drew me to this book. How did all these plants that I'm tending um, get their names? And what are the stories behind them? So Wells looks back to when starts where um, flowers were used as charms, as protection or, or even sometimes curses. She talks about uh, Greek and Roman myths uh, about Narcissus and Hyacinth and, and uh, talks about Native American cultures um, mm -hmm. with the, Ar Ar the Oswego tea. Um, it was later used as a substitute for tea after the Boston Tea Party. Mm -hmm. uh, you might know this as bee bomb or Minardia. Um, she tells of monks and missionaries studying plants near their homes. And, and as travel to open the world up, um, those folks went to study plants um, there too, along with fearless explorers and botanists who uh, often uh, risk life and limb and, and sometimes even their lives just to bring home uh, specimens of these plants um, as they travel. Um, it talks about... Uh, tales of politics and trade and how both of them both hampered and um, increased access to uh, specimens of new plants. There were some really good stories in this book. Um, she talks about early on how flowers were named um, after what they might look like, like bluebells or ladies mantle um, or about ailments they thought, you know, might be used to cure, um, like lung warts were, was thought as a, a medicine to cure lung diseases. Um, another pretty one that I like is cloudberry, named uh, for the fact that it grows where the clouds settle low mm -hmm. over the mountains. Um, 
<clears throat> many of these plants are still called by those common by those common names. Um, so as time went on, um, scientific studies really changed how uh, plants were named. More and more botanists came on the scene using Latin and Greek names uh, for the plants. In the 18th century, um, Linnaeus, who's called the father of modern taxonomy, uh, revolutionized how plants uh, were named and classified. Uh, but like others before him, he added names of friends and, and benefactors uh, to those uh, scientific names of the plants that he was talking about. So to basically this 100 plants and how they got their names, it gives us a head history um, of the plant names and, and some really great stories to go with them. Um, wonderfully written and, and beautifully illustrated. So now, you know, when I'm out in my yard, just enjoying that beautiful, the beautiful, beautiful panties that uh, my mother loves so much, I think of um, Pian, the physician of the gods and how in uh, the Iliad, there's a description of uh, Pian healing the wounds of soldiers that were hurt in battle. Um, some stories say that Asclepsis, the god of healing, was um, jealous of Pian, excuse me, Pian. Pian. And uh, so Zeus, Zeus changed uh, Pian into a plant to save him. So now I have this beautiful flower and, and a great story to go with it. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Diana Wells has written a couple similar novels, A Hundred Birds and How They Got Their Names and um, <laughs> The Lives of Trees, An Uncommon History. So that one I have ordered, that'll mm -hmm. be the next of her books um, that I read. It's taken alphabetically by flower, mm -hmm. um, starts with abelias, <coughs> goes back down to zinnias. So this is it, mm. 100 flowers and how they got their names. Oh, that was wonderful. Any questions? Karen, are most of the flowers, um, would you say they're like Eastern East Coast flowers or are they flowers that you would find all, all across the country? All, all across the country. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's not specific to, mm -hmm. to this area. Mm. Nice. And mm -hmm. includes wildflowers? Um, basically, uh, flowers that you would find in your gardens. Yeah. Plants, uh, you know, just stories of how plants came from all over the world. That's great. I think one thing I find really interesting, and I think I'd like to read that book myself, is <laughs> The Cultural History of Botany, of how, how plants have intertwined themselves with uh, with our culture, not just as, as our use of the plants, but our, our imaginative use of plants in, in myth and in story. And the wonderful way that uh, we have, as humans, we have this, um, this we, have to, we have to name things. And the names we give to the plants are, are just sometimes just so wonderful. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a, a great thing to, uh, to know more about that. So thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. Um, do we have enough? We have someone who'd like to go next. Uh, yeah, I'll go next. Um, All right, Scott. Okay. Um, my book is called Electrify, an optimist's playbook for a clean energy future by Saul Griffith. And um, so unlike, I guess, Karen's book, this is a change the world kind of book. Um, and this is not maybe a typical, you know, nature club topic. It's not about trees or birds or, or the, uh, the natural world per se. But I would say that the future of all of those things, really all the natural world is put in jeopardy by human caused climate change. Um, it's really easy to become depressed about things because there are all these dire effects on our planet that are uh, occurring now or possibly getting worse in the future. And then we hear about, you know, political action or political um, inaction, I would say, and entrenched business interests that, you know, are, are not helping to solve the problem. 
Um, so it was in that environment, I guess, back in early December that I caught part of the Radio Times program hosted by Marty Moss Cohen on WHYY mm -hmm. uh, 91 FM. Uh, she was interviewing the author. Uh, and the thrust of his argument was that uh, climate change can be effectively limited by switching our society immediately to electric technologies. And um, this electric future that he's proposing will require less of the Earth's resources than we use today. And it, importantly, it will not require sacrificing our standard of living. Um, and I should mention that his argument is mainly based around the United States. And only at the very end does he maybe discuss you know, how this would have any impact over the rest of the world. Um, so this author's line of thinking, I would say it appealed to me on two levels, first as a nature lover, uh, but also as some of you know, I'm an electrical engineer. Um, and even though my engineering specialty is not in like utility scale power systems and, you know, uh, power plants and things like that, I was really eager to read about this, how this audacious plan could really, uh, claim to solve a very thorny problem of our times. So he starts out by explaining, I guess, the urgency of re, uh, reducing mm -hmm. CO2 emissions. And um, he, he loves to use, he's an engineer, I should mention that. And he uses uh, diagrams really liberally to talk about his arguments. And um, a few of the first diagrams he brings out are, you know, first of all, just reinforcing that the use of fossil fuels is responsible for the lion's uh, share of CO2 emissions, and that really, in, in order to limit uh, temperature increases to 1.5 degrees C, uh, the time that we have to cut our CO2 emissions in half is really growing fairly short. Uh, if we'd started cutting in the year 2000, we would have, would have had 30 years to make each 50% cut. But actually, since the year 2000, CO2 emissions have increased, and now we have you know basically less than 10 years to make our first 50% cut. So it's you know, a very urgent problem. And he compares like, this time scale, I guess, against uh, the time it's historically taken societies to adopt new technologies. Uh, I know we sort of think of you know, the internet as being a very recent thing and a very recent innovation, but in reality, it's the technologies behind it are 50 years old. And if you think about things like televisions or radio or uh, you know, earlier things like that, they took many, many years to diffuse through society and making a big transition like electrifying everything is a similar sort of problem. And um, he sort of uh, uses this as his argument why we can't just really rely on the free market to do things that we really do need some, you know, sort of intervention to get this process underway. And then he compares, I guess, the current crisis against uh, some of the urgent crises we faced in the past, like World War II and the civil rights movement and the ozone hole and the energy crises of the 70s. And he uses these examples to kind of build confidence that we can scale up America's might really to solve this problem. Um, he talks about some of, the, some of the solutions that we started coming up with in the 70s are not really adequate to address climate change. You know, one of the things we often think about is, well, can we just become more efficient? Can we, you know, maybe, you know, dr drive our car a little less or buy a little smaller car? Um, but the fact is that, um, you know, doing those things is fine. But in the end, you still have a bunch of your infrastructure that's emitting CO2. And we need to stop that emissions of CO2. You know, an electric car, really any electric car, would produce far larger gains in terms of overall energy efficiency uh, as compared to just making small, uh, you know, incremental reductions in, in our personal usage. So then I guess we'll get we'll get to sort of the meat of his argument. How how are we going to electrify America? Um, this engineering specialty is thinking about the energy flows that sort of come into and go out of our economy. And so he advocates for basically making clean energy every place you can, um, eliminating fossil fuel plants, uh, replacing renewables with uh, replacing those with renewables and battery storage, electrifying transportation, you know, our cars and buses and trains and eventually airplanes, um, and electrifying buildings. You know, using heat pumps instead of gas furnaces and and, and gas water heaters. 
uh, getting rid of electric, uh, I'm sorry, getting rid of gas stoves, replacing those with electric stoves, and switching to LED lighting. And then um, one of the surprising things I, I learned in this book was how much of our national energy usage is um, out there for just mining and drilling and refining fossil fuels. It's actually 11% of our entire energy consumption as a nation. And if we stop, you know, mining and drilling and refining fossil fuels, we save that 11%. And, uh, you know, that, that's a great thing. And so he, he goes on to talk about how this is a feasible plan, you know, how we really need a diversity of clean power sources. Um, we need a better electrical grid, which might in some cases mean, you know, building new transmission lines to the places where, you know, like, for example, the Southwest, where there's more solar energy than there might be right here. Um, and we need batteries, you know, to smooth out the variability of electric demand across the day and across seasons. Um, and, you know, you might say, well, you're going to need all the batteries for that. Um, he, one of the other little interesting figures he trots out was that the world currently, you know, batteries are composed even in electric cars and things like that of little metal cylinders, you know, similar to your AA batteries, your D batteries. The world actually produces 90 billion similar cylinders a year, and they're called bullets. And, you know, what if we change those bullets into batteries instead? So, and then he talks about how we're going to pay for all this. Um, we need to eliminate some artificial barriers to growing, uh, going green. You know, in Australia, uh, when you put rooftop solar on your rooftop, it costs one third of the price that it does in the United States. And a lot of this is due to just inefficiencies in the way we do things. We require a lot of permits and inspections, and and there are a lot of middlemen, you know, that, that are collecting a lot of uh, money. You know, it's almost treated like a custom home improvement project every time you want to, uh, you know, add solar to a house. And, and we can we can optimize these things and reduce these costs. And then one of his other key points is that uh, financing is so important that we have to make sure people of all income levels can take advantage of these technologies to electrify their lives, you know, now rather than later. And uh, he brought up, you know, some of the examples of in the Great Depression where in the, uh, the, uh, they electrified, you know, farms and more rural areas uh, using government loan guarantees. And he says, you know, similar things could be done today. Um, so at any rate, I think he, um, you know, overall, I, I really enjoyed reading this book. I uh, uh, worked quite a bit as an engineer, even about how we use energy and how we might change the way we, we use energy. So, um, you know, I, I came out of this book, you know, with a rather optimistic view that this problem is solvable if we kind of put our heads together and uh, and really take the plunge and, uh, you know, move toward electric electric energy. So again, the, the book is called Electrify, and the author is Saul Griffith. So. Any questions? Well, I think Scott, at least from my point, I think the I think the great challenge of our time is going to be dealing with dealing with climate change and anything that can make that, you know something that people can understand and, and show us ways of doing that uh, is just so, so important. So thank you for sharing that with us. I, guess, I think we need a little bit of optimism now and again in this world, because sometimes it's so hard to come by, but you know, I think if we really wanted to get things done, we could. It's not that it's, it's beyond our means. Um, I just hope we have the wisdom to do the right thing for ourselves and for our planet. So. Thank you for bringing that up. We I think that was great. Well, I think we're down to two of our planning the talks, uh, myself and, uh, and, <clears throat> and Eric. Do you have any preference, Eric, whether you, I should go first or you? Uh, it doesn't matter to me, Rich. What, what, what would you like? Um, I'll, go, I'll go now and let you do the finale. How's that? That's fine. Uh -oh. Oh, I, have some, I have a couple of books I want to share. Oh, by all them. means, absolutely. We were delighted. That's, what, oh, show me what you have there. I have The Hidden Life of Trees. Oh, I know that one. It's a great book. So we'll give you a chance to talk to, talk to folks about I'll that. Be very, I'll be very brief. But. Oh, no, no. We have, we have plenty of time. And uh, so we have, we have two people that actually have, have, uh, have planned uh, talks. And then you'll be next after that. How's that? Fine. Okay. 
Well, I guess uh, I guess I'm on. Uh, the book that I chose, uh, I can't really show you um, because it's a. I have it on my Kindle, and I'll, I, I can show you the. Here's the. Uh, you can see the screen here. It's all in there. There you go. I, I, okay, there, yeah, that's that's. So it's um, the nature of oaks, the rich ecology of our most essential trees, and the author is uh, Douglas Ptolemy. I think most of you know who Douglas Ptolemy is. But for those of you who don't, very briefly, he is a, an ecologist, professor at the University of Delaware. And uh, in 2007, he wrote a very influential book called Bringing Nature Home. And the theme of that book, very simply, was that uh, our ecosystems are disintegrating because uh, we've lost track of the fact of what makes biodiversity work. It's an interaction between plants and animals, specifically between the plants and the insects. The insects form the basis for everyone higher in the food chain. So if you want birds, you have to have the insects. If you want insects, you have to have the plants. There's a special relationship many insects have with specific plants. They're called host plants. And those insects will breed only on those host plants. I think most of you are familiar with uh, the relationship between monarchs and, and milkweed. Well, that's common in the insect world. We have some generalists. But most insects uh, breed on specific plants. But if you take those native plants away, even if you put uh, all sorts of other green plants from other parts of the world there in your yard, uh, you're not going to have the insects. And if you don't have the insect, the birds, you know, the, the birds are not able to sustain their, uh, sustain themselves, and the ecosystem basically is degraded to, to the point that it collapses. So that was his message then. And then in 2020, he wrote a book called Nature's Best Hope, which he expands on those themes. And then last spring, he published uh, The Nature of Oaks. And uh, I can see why uh, Dr. Ptolemy loves oaks so much, because oaks as a group, that's Venus Quercus, uh, have more life on them and more interactions of living things on them than any other tree species, any other tree group. Uh, they're very important for biodiversity, and, and he emphasizes that over and over again. Now, oaks are, um, it's a large genus, about 600 oak species in the world, not, not 90 in the United States. It's the largest tree genus in the Northern Hemisphere. Usually it's, it's uh, separated into the white oak group, red oak group, something called the canyon oak. We don't have them around here. They, but that includes the live oak that grow in the, in the south and in the west. Uh, a live oak, by the way, simply means an oak that does not lose its leaves in the winter, sort of like a holly. So that when you talk about the live oak, it's not live oak or dead oak, it's about its, uh, how it refers to the leaves. Now, the book itself is a rather short book. It's conversational in tone. It's not a, a scientific tone that you have to have a degree to read. It's entertaining and it's informative. And I'm, I just, I, I found something on every single page about oaks that I didn't know. And it was blowing me away listening to some of these things. And it's enjoyable. Uh, Dr. Ptolemy has filled the book with beautiful photographs. He, photo, he does the inside photographs himself. Had I known about that, I would not have bought the Kindle version. I would have run for the, the hardcover because I'm, I'm missing all those wonderful color photographs. I just get the little tiny black and white versions. Uh, the structures are also very simple. He talks about how when he moved to his present home in 2000, he planted an acorn from white oak. And that acorn grew into a tree that's now 45 feet tall. And, and so at the beginning of every chapter, and the chapters are based, his chapters are based on the on months of the year, there are 12 chapters. And that's sort of how he organizes the information, the life cycle of an oak through the year. And each year he, sp he picks out some element about oak ecology and talks about it. Um, and also there's a, a couple of appendices. One is how to, how to plant an oak, how do you grow an oak tree? And he recommends the best thing to do is to do it with, is getting an acorn. Don't go and, and buy a large oak that's been uh, nursery uh, raised. You can you can do that, of course. But if you grow your own oak from an acorn, the, the root system is probably going to be much stronger and the tree is going to be much more long live. Uh, the only trade-off is, of course, if you start with the acorn, it takes a long time to get an oak. Uh, 
And by the way, you don't just plant the acorn in the ground because probably a white-footed mouse or a vole will get it. You plant it in a pot and you protect the pot from, from, from the rodents. And then when the tree is uh, maybe uh, one to two years old, you transplant it in the ground. And then you have to protect the leaves from the deer and uh, other foragers until it gets tall enough that, it, that, it's, that it's on its own. But anyway, he also has a, an appendix. What are the best oaks that, for your area, for each region of the country? <clears throat> and, a, and a full list of the oak species of, of, of the United States. Um, interesting, he said, that, you know, for example, uh, some of the interesting facts about the oaks is uh, the oak root system is huge for most oak trees. It has 10 times the biomass of the leaves and the shoots. And you used to, you know, you've probably heard that the uh, root mass of a tree is usually about the same size of a canopy. That's incorrect. For the oaks is probably three times the size. It's very large. Now, people know oaks are long-lived, uh, but they don't realize that oaks are really fast growers as well. They, they grow quite rapidly as trees. And here's something that blew me away. Under ideal conditions, an oak can live for over a thousand years. That's right, a thousand years. It said that it's broken down into sort of three categories. The first 300 years, it's growing. The second 300 years, it's sort of just a, a good mature tree. And the final 300 years, it slowly falls apart. I think of the Salem oak on that, which was slowly falling apart before it, it fell over a couple of years ago. He talked about a, a single tree called the angel oak uh, that's found in Charleston, South Carolina. And that oak is proven to be more than 1,500 years old. Uh, I just found that quite amazing. Now, they, you know, the oaks also uh, provide ecological services for us. They provide uh, the which provide soil stabilization and the leaves because the leaves uh, of oak trees fall late and they're less likely to decay. They decay slower than uh, most trees. Uh, when it rains, they protect the soil uh, from erosion. And of course, carbon sequestration is also something that oaks can do. So oaks are very useful. But the most important thing about oaks is the amount of life that an oak tree can, uh, can harbor. The diversity of life and and that the biomass itself is extraordinary for the oaks and, and i'll get into that in just a little while later but i want to talk about something that is, is very that I, i've always found interesting that's called the mutualism between oaks and jays uh, i think most of us know now that jays blue jays in our area are the principal dispersal agents for oak trees um, that relationship goes back a very very long way um, the first jays appeared in the fossil record about 60 million years ago. That's just a few hundred, that's a few million years after the end of the dinosaurs in what we call the Paleogene. And that was about the same time that the oak species evolved. The oak species evolved after the, after the Cretaceous uh, in, the, in the Paleogene. And so these two creatures, these two organisms evolved together. The oaks found, the, the jays found oaks were a great source of food. The acorns were very nutritious. They have uh, lots of carbohydrates. They have fats. They have proteins. And the jays, and there are, there are about 40 species of jays in the world and eight species in the United States. The one species we see here is the blue jay. Everybody knows the blue jay. But you know, he's one of uh, about 40 species in the world that are in, 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 the, uh, in the jay genus. And jays have actually been, uh, they've evolved in and they've changed physiologically because of their association with the yolks. For example, on the beak of the jay, there's a little tiny hook, and the, pur the purpose of that hook is to rip open acorns. It's to feed on, on acorns, and also the, they call the guller pouch, the, the craw of the of the uh, of the jay, has expanded so that it can fit five acorns in it at the same time. <laughs> so what what jays do? They, they collect acorns in the fall. And they, they cache them. That is, they, they, they put them away, they bury them for, for future reference, like many rodents do as well. But, but jays do it a little bit differently. They don't put them into, into, into one single spot and they just they hide them. They put them here and there and everywhere. And what they do is they go to areas uh, where the soil is easily worked, that they can bury this, uh, shallowly bury the, the acorn uh, into a field somewhere or, or a forest edge, something like that. And for the oak, uh, this is this is wonderful because when it, uh, the acorns fall from the oak tree, they, if they, they fall in the forest, they fall into the tree in the dense shade. They don't have much of a chance of growing into into a, uh, an oak should they should they germinate. 
but you take an acorn and you put it in, into the ideal situation where a new oak can, can grow in an open space and get plenty of sunlight. And so jays have become the dispersal agents and they can, they can take an acorn and they plant them separately as much as a mile away from the, uh, uh, from the tree where they found them. And here's something that I found really amazing that, that uh, Doug uh, Ptolemy talks about. The average blue jay will plant approximately 4,500 acorns a year. Can you imagine that? Now, studies have shown that uh, <clears throat> the jays can only remember where about 20% of them are. And so the rest of them, and you do your simple math, that's 3,360 oak trees that the jay plants every year. And the average jay can live for 17 years. Can you imagine how many oak trees our simple common backyard blue jay is planted? So next time you see a blue jay, think about that. I think it's absolutely remarkable. In fact, I had a, um, several years ago, I kept noticing willow oaks coming up in my yard. I was, I, I happened to like willow oaks, they're a beautiful tree, but I said, where are they coming from? I live next to a woods, but there are no willow oaks in the woods behind my house. And willow oaks are also a street tree in the town that I, that I live in, but there's no willow oak within blocks. I mean, they're, they're, they're quite distant. And then I figured out, then I found out, well, there must be some, the jays. They have flown all the way here uh, from wherever they picked up the oak. They buried it in my yard. And now I have several uh, willow oaks that are over 20 feet tall. And I, thank, and I thank the jays for that. Another interesting thing about oak trees is, is masting. The mast is the acorn crop. Um, and that means every, every few years, and it's sort of irregular, oak trees in a particular group, and, I mean, and that is like all the red oak groups, for example, or all the white oak groups, in one particular year, produce a huge amount of oak tree, of, uh, of acorns. Why on earth would, would it do that? Then the next year and the year after that, they, they produce an average or a below average amount. What's that all about? Well, there are a couple of theories that Ptolemy mentions about that. Uh, one is it's a foil to, uh, to uh, control predation on the oaks. If, if the oaks produce the same amount of acorns every year, a lot of acorn predators would rise to the, to the level of the abundance of the fruit, and they would eat all the acorns every year. So if the oaks one year produce a huge amount of, of, of acorns beyond what the predators can, 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 uh, can eat or store, they have a much better chance of those uh, the acorns germinating in the trees. And then the next year, of course, the predators at that point will start increasing the family size because the full, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the food sources have, have increased, but the next year is very likely going to be a low mast year, and that keeps and then the, 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 that controls the size of the predator population. A couple of other theories was it has to do with with uh, maximizing pollination, and whether, whether it's simply a matter of energy allocation. Sometimes the uh, the oak will, will put its energy in, into growth, and sometimes will put it in into uh, flowering and to uh, producing seed. I want to talk to you about. Uh, about something very special. When you think about acorns, have you ever thought of an acorn as somebody's home, as a, as a habitat? Well, it is. There's something, there's a, a little um, creature called an acorn weevil, for example. That's the genus Cuculio. And there's about 22 species uh, around here. The, the, the family's huge, the Cuculio die, have worldwide over 83,000 species. It's one of the largest species uh, one of the largest uh, family of, of, uh, of species in the world. Uh, but they are the, the acorn weevil. What happens here is the acorn weevil, the adult will come when the acorn is, is, is forming on the tree in, in summer. And now weevils have a really long sort of stretched out protuberance of, of, uh, on their head. And at the very end of that is, is their teeth. So it's sort of like a drill. And they get on the acorn and they drill a little hole in it. And then they lay one egg inside the hole and they patch the hole up. The egg hatches and the larva of the acorn weevil is inside an acorn where it's protected from predators. It has an ample food supply. And for the rest of that summer, it, it feeds itself and it grows inside the acorn. But then when the acorn falls, that's when the, the weevil has to come out because the life cycle changes at this point. It drills a little hole in the acorn and gets out 
And what it has to do, and this is the time when it's really at, uh, at risk, because it then has to get under the soil and dig down into and create a burrow where it, where it uh, stays until it finally emerges as an adult. Uh, I went out to try and find an acorn to see if I could see any, see that. I couldn't find one because it's the wrong time of the year and there are no acorns. But I have these to show you. I don't know if you can see this very well. Um, can't see, can't see, okay. I'm trying to get it so I can actually see my own screen full screen. Maybe seeing somebody else. I can do this. Okay. If you look very closely at this uh, over here. Uh, okay. You can see that. Okay. There, there it is. This is an acorn. Um, it's, it's, it's not a local acorn. This is an acorn from uh, a coastal live oak in Southern California. And I picked this up when I was out there. But did you see the little hole in it? And here's another one with a cap on it. And if you look at the right up. You right there? That is very likely, I, I can't prove what it is, but it's very likely that was made by an acorn weevil. So next time you, you see some acorns, check them out for the little holes in there. But that's not the end of it. Once the, uh, the weevil has left the acorn, someone else moves in. There's a genus of ants called uh, temnothorax ants. And they're tiny little things. They're half the size of a grain of sand. And they live inside acorns that have been formerly used by the, uh, by the acorn weevils. They live in, in colonies of about 100. And of course, inside there, they can get in, but the, the larger predators can't. It's like they're living inside a fortress. So you think they have it made, but they don't. Nature's never that simple. There are other species of temnothorax ants that act as what's called slave-making ants. And what they do, they, they're small enough to get in the hole, they will, they will attack the colony, kill the queen and the workers, and abduct the larvae and take them back to raise them as basically slave ants in their own colony. It is an amazing story. And all this is happening inside an acorn. It's quite amazing. Then there's the acorn moth, uh, Blastobasis, uh, which also uh, has a acorn as part of its, its life cycle. You probably noticed that uh, oak leaves stay on the trees for a long time. That's something called marcescence. Uh, and uh, the, so the leaves remain on many oaks throughout almost the entire winter. It takes them almost till spring to fall, for the leaves to finally fall. And we're not sure exactly why that happens, but Dolly, uh, Doug Ptolemy has some theories about it. One, he thinks that perhaps it, it protects the, uh, the, the winter buds from foraging because it'd be sort of the, the foragers would have to go, go through all the leaves to get to them. And simply the noise would, would possibly put them off. Um, uh, another idea is that um, leaves on the tree catch more snow in winter and therefore uh, would uh, provide more water to the roots of the trees when the, when the snow melts. And also that the, perhaps when the leaves do fall, they form a, a, a layer that uh, would be de de decaying at the right time to provide a fertilizer for the, uh, um, <clears throat> for the oak tree in the spring when it needs it. Now, the whole point of uh, Doug Ptolemy's book, again, is about the diversity of life that lives on the oaks. He says that there are, for example, 511 moth species in, that are found right here in the Delaware Valley living on oak trees. 511 species of uh, Lepidoptera. Le Lepidoptera. And nationwide, that, re that raises to 897 species documented as being hosted by oaks. That's an amazing amount. Uh, the next uh, largest uh, group of plants for hosting uh, uh, hosting Lepidopera, moths and butterflies, you know, the cherries with, with about 400. And surprisingly, some of our great native trees have uh, relatively few. The tulip tree, for example, hosts only 29 species. They have the tulip tree moth, which is well known, but far fewer species than the oaks. Curiously, the oaks also uh, host only about 33 species of butterflies, and in 15 of those are hair streaks. So there's a special relationship between hair streaks and, uh, and, and the oaks. But the question arises, the question arises. What? What? someone say something? Oh. The question arises, why are there so many uh, species of insect that are hosted on oak trees? 
and we, we don't actually know, but Doug comes up with a, a theory about that, that basically it has to do with the way over evolutionary time, insects and plants adapt to each other. Now, when plants are attacked, they have chemical defenses. They put out chemicals to ward off the foragers that are eating their leaves. And then, and there are two types, whether they're qualit qualitative and quantitative. Now, uh, qualitative is a toxin. For example, the, the toxins in milkweed that makes it almost you know, unpalatable for, for all for, for most species, except for those few species that have spent a great deal of evolutionary time and effort to adapt their uh, chemical systems to uh, being able to uh, deal with with chemicals, and then actually using those as the, as the monarchs do to to protect themselves. The oaks, on the on the, on the other hand, use qualitative or quantitative. Uh, and, and for the most part, it's the tannins in the oak that 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 that, that, that they use, and those they, they they don't they're not toxic, but they do tend to impede the protein assimilation. So the more you eat, the less you get, and it's likely that that over time gave many more species of insects the ability to adapt chemically to the tannins in the oak, and therefore to find the oaks palatable, and uh, a good source of uh, food and a, a welcome host plant. I just want to finish up very, just very briefly talking about some of the wonderful insects that the, the Douglas colony has photographed and has talked about that are that you find on the oak trees. And this is just a sampling of them. Uh, there's the ambiguous litter moth, cinnipid gall wasps, the, fa the famous polyphemus moth, our second largest moth, uh, inchworms, that's the uh, larva of the geometer moths, uh, the underwing moth, the oak tree, Oak tree hoppers and the oak leaf hoppers, the yellow vested moth, the katydids, something called this, and this is uh, this is an amazing creature. It's called the spun glass slug caterpillar, and it looks like it's made of spun glass. It's just extraordinary. There's the oak beauty caterpillar, the lace bugs, and their main uh, predator, the lace wings, which are often found on on uh, on white oaks. Uh, so when you think of an oak, uh, think of all the life. That, that oak sustains and all the biodiversity that the, that oak is responsible for and that's why doug calls these the essential trees of our forest and they're a keystone species and so i highly recommend doug's book uh the nature of oaks it's uh, a, a book that i think is entertaining educational and uh, just a joy to read and uh, and uh, so that's basically what i wanted to talk to you about tonight so i think i was a little longer than i meant to be but I just get wrapped up into this sometimes. So thank you very much. And uh, if, if there are no questions, we'll move on to our, 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 next, uh, our next presenter. Thanks, Rich. You're welcome, okay. So I'm Eric, Eric Mollenhauer. I'm going to test the audience. I wanna ask you a question and see if anybody knows the answer before I tell you anything about the book. So I'm gonna hold up a poster and ask people if they know what it is that they're looking at. Cave painting? Yeah. The paintings in Spain. And what kind of what kind of critters are you seeing? Can you back it up a little bit, Eric? Thank you. I have a buffalo. Okay. Anything else? Horses? horses? Yeah, horses. That's what I wanted you to notice for sure was the horses. So you're looking at some of the uh, cave paintings of, um, I'm going to say our ancestors. Uh, if, you're, if you're of Northern European stock, those are probably done by your ancestors and mine. There's a lot fewer people around then. Uh, those are some of the... Um, horses that would have been around maybe 30 to 40,000 years ago. The oldest cave drawings in Lascaux Cave are about 30 to 40,000 years back. What does that have to do with the book? <clears throat> so the book I'm going to tell you about, it's called Wilding and it has a picture of horses on the cover. Uh, the, the, the full title is Wilding, Returning Nature to Our Farm. And the author is Isabella Tree. 
And when I first saw that, like, oh, come on, your your last name can't be Tree. It's like my name is like uh, Eric uh, Fungalfoot. No way, you know, like Isabella Tree. But that is her name. And the book is about a farm in England, southern England, not far from Gatwick Airport, one of the two major airports of the country. And... It's a story of how they have been rewilding the farm. It's a farm that was in her husband's family for the last 250 years, roughly. So generation after generation of her husband have lived on that farm. It's called the Nep Estate. It was originally a playland for um, the barons and uh, landed gentry of uh, William the Conqueror, if you go all the way back. But it's 2,400 acres. When her husband got the farm uh, from his grandparents, he inherited it from his grandparents in about um, 1987, the farm was already losing money. Because after World War II, in England and especially the United States, Agriculture started to become an industrial operation. An industrial operation was dependent on chemicals, um, fertilizers, machinery, um, making bigger and bigger and bigger farms. In the case of England, that meant getting rid of hedgerows, draining wetlands, whether it's in England or here, because the more land you put in agriculture, the more money you make. So it became farming on an industrial scale. And his grandparents, like many farmers in England, did that after World War II because that was the way things were going. The governments were subsidizing agriculture as they still do today. And so, um, but by 1987, when Isabel Tree's husband got the farm, it was losing money. So he, embarked on every modernization that he could come up with because he was sure that he could make the farm turn, you know, turn a, a dollar or a pound, I should say, pound sterling. And so um, over the next uh, about 13 years, uh, he tried everything he could to make it um, go into black. But by approximately the year 2000 it was clear that they were gonna lose the farm because that had been in the family for 250 years. So they decided to try something different. They sold the dairy cattle, they, uh, which they'd been milking maybe three times a day. I think now dairy farms like the one near us in Gloucester County milk four times a day perhaps. But they, they got rid of the machinery, they sold the machinery, and they decided they would rewild the farm. They would take it back to what it had been before agriculture destroyed it and destroyed most of the species that had been there. The question, of course, would be, take it back to when? Take it back to 40,000 years ago when um, horses were roaming Europe uh, the, the cave horses. So they did a lot of study, they did a lot of work, and in the years that followed, they began to rewild it. Um, in 2000, the year 2000, they sold the machinery, sold the dairy. In 2003, three years later, they decided to add old English longhorn cattle to the farm not huge herds, but a number of cattle. Because the idea was that before people change things, there were large fauna, megafauna, that served a useful purpose, kind of like the buffalo here in North America. The buffalo changed and reshaped the land in some respects and made habitats for uh, animals and plants that when the buffalo disappeared, a lot of those places that the buffalo created disappeared with them. So they brought in longhorn cattle. 
Um, they also brought in, in that same year, in 2003, Exmoor ponies. Now, Exmoor, maybe some of you know, there's two famous moors in England. There's Dartmoor and Exmoor in the south of England. And Exmoor ponies are one of the oldest breeds of ponies in the world. They probably are very similar to what you saw on the cave there. They look very similar. And in fact, they have found uh, fossil uh, bones, remains of Exmoor ponies um, in the UK that they think are about 50,000 years old. So there were ponies in England at one time, and they were probably very closely related in appearance and, and genetics to the, uh, the ones in the cave drawings there. So they added the ponies. In 2007, they noticed that turtle doves appeared on their farm for the first time. Now, you remember the 12 days of Christmas, you know, your true love brought turtle doves and so on. One of the interesting things in the book is they tell you that they're not actually turtle doves. The first part of that name comes from the sound that the dove makes mm. when it's cooing. And it sounds like a turtur, turtur. So actually they were turtur doves, but they hadn't been seen in that farm in I don't know how many years, decades or even longer. But they came back as they started to rewild it. They also added in 2009, uh, wild pigs or boars, and they added fallow deer, some of the native deer that had been part of England's past, that the kind of deer that would have been hunted by William the Conqueror and his nobles. So they found that the pigs and the deer rooted things up a lot and destroyed certain areas. But by rooting things up and destroying certain areas, it created more diversity because what the farm had essentially been lacking was diversity. And they discovered that a lot of these big megafauna created that diversity, added to the niche habitats that had uh, long since disappeared. In 2012, they started to have nightingales uh, forming territories on the, uh, on the farm. Nightingales are a bird that goes way back in English history. Shakespeare talked about it in a number of different plays that he wrote. And they were pretty much an endangered bird in England. And here was this place which hadn't had any nightingales. And by 2012, 12 years after they started rewilding, it now had 20, uh, 34 nesting territories of them. And then by 2015, they became the site of the UK's largest breeding population of purple emperor butterflies. The purple emperor is a beautiful butterfly. It's the second largest butterfly in England and it was almost extinct. And in 12 years, they ended up being the place. If you wanna see purple emperor butterflies in England, it's the place to go. Mm. By 2018, just a few years ago, they had soil scientists come in and found that the amount of organic material in the soil had doubled in 12 years. And the amount of mycelial network, the, the soil fungi, the network of soil fungi had tripled had tripled in the span of from 2000 to 2018. This is important in terms of climate change because if you can hold carbon in the soil, that's what you want to do. You don't want it in the atmosphere. You want it locked up in soil and in trees and in uh, rock material and so on. So they were showing just in the span of 18 years, what was possible to do that you could start to bring back species like the purple emperor butterfly, which were almost extinct, or the nightingale, which was a part of their cultural history, but almost very rare to see in England anymore. And it's become really a story of hope, I, I think, 
Um, in some of the colleges now, they're teaching classes called restoration ecology. We're beginning to work with some colleges in Texas as part of the Gloucester County Nature Club project that we've done, the Big Year Eco Challenge. And we're working with a professor there who teaches a course in restoration ecology. And that's what basically this story is all about. It's about restoring what used to be there, making it a more, um, a more vital, diverse habitat. They have been bringing back beaver. That's one of the last things that they've done just in the last two years. Now, not the American beaver. There's a European beaver, a different species. They do not interbreed. But they hadn't been seen in England in, I don't know, you know, maybe centuries. Uh, I, I think they tell in the book, but I forget what it is. But probably for the last at least several hundred years. Um, and there was a lot of controversy about that. Why would we want to bring beavers back? They're going to create problems. And of course, what they found on their farm was that the beavers created dams. They flooded areas, which created more habitat. And it also retained water when there was too much rain and floods, because you may or may not remember, but England has had its